Cormac McCarthy in The Passenger and Stella Maris gives us a commentary on Jewish intelligence. And this is important because the two main characters in the novels, Bobby and Alicia Western, are Jewish. Their mom was an Orthodox Jew, and it's unconfirmed, but her their dad was probably Jewish also. And in the novel, Alicia comments on how she knew that she was Jewish before she was ever told. No, I knew something. Anyway, my forebears counting coppers out of a clack dish are what have brought me to this sta station in life. Jews represent 2% of the population and 80% of the mathematicians. If those numbers were even a little more skewed, we'd be talking about a separate species. Isn't that a bit far-fetched? No, it isn't far-fetched enough. And this is Alicia talking again. You can have separate histories in the same house. Darwin's question remains unanswered. How do we come by mental abilities that have no history? How is it that the brain seems to pre prepare for what's coming? No idea. How much of the brain's circuitry is undedicated, simply awaiting the arrival of new opportunities? Any? How does making change in the market prepare one's grandchildren for quantum mechanics, for topology? And when we look at the Manhattan Project and physics and mathematics at this time, it was predominantly crowded with Jewish individuals. And what's interesting about this, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard this before, is that Ashkenazi Jews, according to a paper put out by MIT titled Natural History of Ashkenazi Intelligence, uh, quote, Ashkenazi Jews have the highest average IQ of any ethnic group for which there are reliable data. data. They score 0.75 to 1.0 standard deviations above the general European average, corresponding to an IQ of 112 to 115. And another way to think about this is that the average Ashkenazi Jew has a higher IQ score than 80% of the rest of the population. So that's pretty, pretty crazy. But what's even crazier, in 2024 now, 26% of Nobel Prize winners in physics have been Ashkenazi Jews. And Ashkenazi Jews only represent 0.25 of a percent of the population, which it's absolutely mind-blowing. And so now we, now that I've got some of the data and we'll look at another passage from Cormac in a second, what does this mean? First of all, do IQ tests really matter? And I would argue that, of course, IQ measures certain types of intelligence, which include logic, learning ability, ab you know, abstract ideas, you know, working with your memory and whatnot, but they don't really get into social intelligence, creativity, and those types of things. But having an ability and a talent in those areas, and most of the time, these, that's what an IQ test is. You don't really know what's going to be on the test. You just take it and see how well you can solve something. That is really big. And Cormac actually commentates in Stella Mars about IQ tests. Quote, I've never met anyone in this business who had any graphs at all of mathematics, and she's talking by, about psychiatry. And intelligence is numbers. It's not words. Words are things we've made up. Mathematics is not. The math and logic questions on the IQ test are a joke. How did it get this that way? Intelligence as numerical? Maybe it always was. Or maybe we actually got there by counting. For a million years before the first word was ever said. If you want an IQ over 150, you better be good with numbers. And so Cormac, through the character of Alicia, is kind of send, uh, sending us mixed signals with that information because obviously he's also working with the character that's not exactly him. But as we've talked about before, Cormac views people who can do math and science as kind of higher than people who are into poetry and language because poetry and words are made up. Mathematics is something deeper. It's, and intelligence is measured through your ability to understand physics and mathematics, according to Cormac. And so... That last statement, if you want an IQ over 150, you better be good with numbers, is basically saying that the IQ test is valid at some level in its ability to test people for intelligence. Cormac's version of intelligence is with numbers, excuse me, being proficient with numbers and science. And so it sounds like Cormac's a, a supporter of the IQ test. And as I've said before in this program, the only people who love the IQ test are people who are great at math and science. So what are your guys' theories out there? I obviously think that this is super weird to talk about one ethnic group being better than another ethnic group because that can obviously be problematic. But this has been studied. And so what, what do you guys think the cause of this is? And the MIT paper talks about a couple different things. First, that just... It just is what it is because uh, Sephardic Jews and Oriental Jews, um, and that's what the paper calls them, uh, 
apparently do not have this same IQ range. They, they are just, you know, at the middle of the pack in terms of, you know, ethnic IQ ability. The second is quoting the paper is that the Ashkenazianism experienced very low inward gene flow which created a favorable situation for natural selection. The third reason, and I'm reading now from the top of the screen, is that they experienced an, an unusual selective pressures that were likely to have favored increased intelligence. For the most part, they had jobs in which increased IQ strongly favored economic success, in contrast with other populations who were mostly peasant farmers. They lived in circumstances in which economic success led to increased reproductive success. The fourth is the existence of the Ashkenazi spingolode DNA repair and other disease clusters, groups of biochemically related mutations that could not plausibly have reached their present high frequencies by chance that are not common in adjacent, adjacent populations and that have physiological effects that could increase intelligence. Continuing, other selective factors have been suggested. Winnowing through persecution suggests that only the smartest Jews survive persecution. Why this should be so is not clear. There is no similar outcome in other such groups as the gypsies who have faced frequent persecution. Another theory suggests that there was selective breeding for Talmudic scholarship. This seems unlikely to have been an important selective factor since there were ver weren't very many professional rabbis, certainly less than 1% of the population. A selective force that only affects a tiny fraction of the population can never be strong enough to cause important evolutionary change in tens of, th tens of generations. A plausible variant of the Talm Talmudic scholarship model suggests that it was likely a sexually selected marker and that rich families preferred to marry their daughters to males who excelled, so that the payoff to intelligence was indirect rather than direct as we suggested. Without detailed historical demographic information, it'll be difficult to evaluate this hypothesis. So this is MIT putting this out. I don't know if any of this is necessarily true. I've looked at multiple sources that do pit them as the highest IQ scores, but those theories, who knows? What do you guys think? If I had to take a guess, I would probably say it was a combination of a couple things. Uh, probably one of them being it was just a marker in society. That's kind of when you look at cultures, if there is certain markers for you know ambition and it's rewarded, then obviously if that the, that culture you know practices that same marker for thousands of years, the processes, the epigenetics, like the other things, are going to be a little bit more ingrained in that population to you know set you up for success. But there are obviously environment you know that could be broken very easily. You could be an Ashkenazi Jew who's been in this lineage and say, I'm done with this and move to, you know, Huntington Beach and just want to surf with your kids all day and you don't really care about that stuff. And I'm sure your kids won't have an IQ score that is any different than anyone else around them. So I really don't feel like it's genetic. I think it's more just of a cultural thing, if I had to guess. Another thing I forgot to mention is that uh, Ashkenazi Jews account for more than half of world chess champions. And it could also just be one of these things that the Ashkenazi population is somewhat small. Like, like I was saying, it's 0.25 of the population. And when you have a very big population, a very big ethnic group, it's it's much easier to become more diversified. But when you have this small ethnic group that is tied to a religion and the values, values and stuff of that and the religion that is still active and even has, has its own country, then you're going to create, like as I was talking about, a certain culture where everyone plays chess chess that like you know you as an Ashkenazi Jew you're just like looking to heroes in your community people who you maybe even know if you're living in a big city like New York you know New York City and you're like wow I can do that too like I want to be like them these are you know idols of mine so that is another theory that I think also plays in there's that community factor and that aspirational factor and this is like all so funny when certain groups or certain places because this obviously transcends uh, excuse me transcends ethnicity for instance like I, lo I love uh, freestyle wrestling and the Midwest of the United States has all these great wrestlers and their programs aren't any better a lot of the time they have less money but everyone cares about wrestling the wrestlers at the school in the Midwest, you know, uh, at the University of Iowa and Oklahoma State and Penn State and, and whatnot, they, they'll sell out a 20,000 person arena to watch wrestling as, you know, the high school I went to, they couldn't even get 10 people to come watch an event in high school. And so there's this support and culture and all these roots that are there. And so when you have a rich private school in California that has, a, you know, an Olympian training everyone and they have all the money for recovering stuff, why can't they beat these random kids from the Midwest who really aren't 
do anything special, it's because there isn't that incentive because you can't come a hero, become a hero. A, a state champion wrestler in high school in, let's say, Arizona is no different than a state volleyball champion to a lot of the people at the school. But if you win the Iowa, you know, 6A state wrestling championship, you are going to be get you know you're going to be getting a D1 scholarship and everyone's going to know about you you're going to be in the paper you're going to be getting interviewed like it's a really big deal so what does the community and the general locality make of this and one of the other things if we look at um Jewish population is that uh if they are orthodox or no orthodox people they like to live near a synagogue because they have to walk to walk to church and you know on on Shabbos and whatnot and so when you have a locality and a lot of Jews living close together in New York City or Miami or Los Angeles or wherever then it is actually a good thing to keep those cultural roots together and then once again it's easier to see your heroes and people excelling because it's not always either like the the westerns are looking at their father who is a very great physicist and their mother their mother was just working at the factory and she's also jewish but they're looking to him and looking to all his friends and they can now romanticize about it. Was the, their father, from what, you know, even though he's a fictional character, he wasn't an Oppenheimer or an Einstein. He was just, you know, in the pack of some of the top physicists in the world. But they look at him and they look at their um, look at their father's friends and they want to be that too. It's just a natural thing that kids want to do, especially that he was a reclusive figure that by the time they were older, they had been removed from the Alamo project and living in Tennessee and living all these other places. And there was kind of this mystery and they were also talented and could be just like him maybe one day. And maybe he would get that attention, give that attention to them, excuse me. So there are a lot of factors working here. And I'm going to be going into this further in my next video, which is on female hysteria, you know, Cormac McCarthy, excuse me, and female hysteria, hysteria because he comments on this. And there is another section in regards to female hysteria that type uh that ties jewish women to that whole movement and to witches and all this other stuff you're gonna have to see that video it's gonna come out right over here very soon peace